welcome to this uh, fourth in the uh, in the series of uh, illuminating COVID. We um, are particularly welcoming to people who are joining us for the uh, for the first time. My name is uh, is Barry Morgan, and I'm chair of uh, of KCRA. For those who are joining us for the first time, I uh, just briefly describe the structure of the event. Our two speakers will, uh, will speak for up to 20 minutes each, followed by 20 minutes of, uh, of moderated questions. You're welcome during the uh, streaming to uh, send in questions using the Q&A button which I will, uh, I will moderate as chairman at the, uh, at the end of the two talks. So it's a tremendous pleasure to uh, introduce firstly, Sir Simon Wesley, who is professor of psychological medicine at King's and a consultant psychiatrist at King's College Hospital and, uh, and Maudsley Hospital. I think it's fair to say that Simon is an innovator he started his research career trying to understand unexplained symptoms and syndromes, as a result of which he established the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Research Unit in 1991. Five years later, he established the Gulf War Illness Research Unit to investigate post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which in uh, 2003 became the King Center for Military Health Research. Simon now stands at the peak of his profession as one of, if not the most respected psychiatrists in the uh, United Kingdom. From 2014 to 17, he was president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, whereupon he immediately became president of the Royal Society of Medicine, a role he has only recently relinquished. He was chair of the government independent review of the Mental Health Act, which reported in uh, December 2018, and will uh, shortly uh, find its uh, recommendations, find their way into a, uh, a white paper. So with that, by way of introduction, Simon. <laughs> Thanks very much, Barry. What a, what a great build up. That's downhill all the way from now on, I'm afraid. So then, let's... Um, Let's start by uh, putting the clock back 12 months, shall we? And um, as Mel will remember, and many other people here will remember, what were we talking about then? We were talking about mental health, and we were talking about how bad it was. Um, we were talking about how little funding there was for it, and how rates were going up, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's all, all of that stuff. And I, I mention all that because before we even get on to COVID, it's very important that we don't have a, a rose-tinted view of the future, like um, whenever you hear anyone talking about the First World War, well, at least those who lived through it, obviously you don't very often these days, but when you did, they always seem to remember the summer before the First World War as a warm, hot summer full of cricket and teas on lawns and tennis and things like that. Actually, it was the wettest summer on record for, for over 40 years. So, and, and, and this time last year, Again, we were talking about mental health and indeed a one particular issue in mental health, which was that um, you might be surprised to know that the rates of mental health in the communities uh, in the UK have been remarkably stable for uh, really about three or four generations, certainly since the Second World War. Um, no great changes in any of the major mental disorders or indeed minor mental disorders as well, despite the fact every single year we always think that things are getting worse. But this time last year, there had been a change. And the first time we'd seen um, for the last few years, there'd been this rise in what we call common mental disorders, namely depression and anxiety, and a true increase. So this is a true population increase, I should say. I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm also an epidemiologist. So I don't normally get out of bed for less than 3,000 people, basically. That's one way of understanding what I do for a living. And that when we did that, when we got out of bed for more than 3,000 people, we saw that um, particularly in children, and young people, or more specifically, uh, young people between 16 and 24, had been this rise in depression and anxiety. So that was happening already before we first heard of COVID. Now, when we did hear of COVID, um, 
several of us uh, uh, realized, uh, it wasn't, I mean, this wasn't rocket science, to be obviously honest with you, that COVID was going to make mental health worse. So we did a, a, a review in The Lancet pointing out that if we go back on previous pandemics, we were likely to see a rise in mental distress in the population. We were likely to see that it would affect particular groups more than anything else, mainly particularly those with pre-existing disorders, those who would suffer economic loss as a result of the pandemic, and those um, who, uh, the, the, the longer it went on for, and the greater the degree of coercive measures used against the population, the greater would be the long-term impact. So I don't like to say I told you so, but we did. I mean, again, lots of other people did as well. And, and by and large, well, not by and large, exactly that is what we have seen happen. So if we went back 12 months ago, um, we would have said that um, the best kind of population surveys would have said that about one in 10 of people would have had depression. This year, 12 months later, now it's one in five. That's about the easiest way of thinking about the size of what have happened. We've gone from one in 10 to one in five. And this has been confirmed by epi studies, population sampling, opinion polling surveys, a lot. All of them have shown that the rates of uh, anxiety, depression have gone up in the population. And this is not a small change, this is a substantial change. Now, why has that happened? Uh, there are lots of reasons. And before I go into a little bit of detail in some of the groups, let's just think about the overall picture. And the real reason for this happening, and remember I've spent my life, as Barry said, studying population reactions to, uh, uh, I said, absurdity. That's actually that probably correct, actually. What I meant to say was adversity. Um, but absurdity has come into it as well, to be honest with you. But population reactions to, uh, to adversity. And we, we have sh shown that actually most of the time, most people are resilient, much more so than we think, and including groups that you might think could be likely to have high rates of sight disorder as a result of, uh, of stress and, and uh, adversity and, and bad things happening, soldiers, which is what I've been looking at for the last 20 years. In general, actually, they don't. Rates, 4% up to 6% may be nothing like what the public say. When we look at the results of disasters, when we look at the results of war, all of these things, people can habituate to remarkable changes in their lives remarkably quickly. And they do that by, by and large without any help from people like me or Mel and, and, and lots of people like us. So they do it without help from counsellors, without help from mental health professionals, whatever they may be. They do it on their own. Well, actually not, not actually on their own. They do it of their own resources. And the biggest resource that people have, probably from time immemorial, is your social networks. The people that you meet, your family, your colleagues, uh, your friends, maybe, maybe your vicar, maybe your GP, but people who you've met before, you will meet again. These are the people you turn to in adversity and having those social networks are what gets you through time and trouble. And uh, it's only those people who don't have such networks who, who tend to be those who are more likely to react. And now you can see the essential wickedness of a pandemic because it uniquely, it gives you the stressor, the adversity, but at the same time it, or more precisely, our measures to control it, destroy the ways in which we actually do adapt and, and uh, uh, deal with those very stressors. In other words, the fact that we bring in harmful measures to mental health, such as social distancing and so on, social isolation, uh, uh, will magnify the effects of the pandemic and indeed prevent uh, the normal ways of dealing with these things kicking in. So that is why pandemics are so fundamentally wicked. Now, of course, of course, they don't affect people equally. And we know also that the history of pandemics is the history of inequality. So inequalities, uh, those more disadvantaged, those who have to work, who can't avoid working, those from all sorts of disadvantaged groups uh, will be uh, more likely to be affected. And the other thing that we know, which may be more of a surprise, is it's absolutely clear that this pandemic has much more effect on you the younger that you are. And that's a huge difference, of course, as we all know from physical health, we know that it's physical complications and uh, right leading up to, uh, uh, up to death, uh, increase in a linear fashion uh, as your age increases. Uh, but the psychological effects do exactly the opposite and the burden falls most of all 
and has fallen most of all on younger people. Um, and again, it's not uh, a small change, a substantial rise in younger people uh, who are the ones who, uh, as I say, are the least affected physically, but will be the most affected socially, psychologically, and economically. Now, all, uh, and, and, and if we have a look at uh, various, uh, various uh, uh, measures of this, we see loneliness increasing in young, not old, overall stable, but particularly increasing in young people, and so on and so forth. Um, so far, we've not seen an increase in deliberate self-harm and suicide, as one might predict. Uh, in fact, in the early days of the pandemic, the deliberate self-harm rates went dramatically down. But that, of course, is because we do those rates uh, from A&E attendances, and A&E became a kind of barren waste uh, for the first part of the pandemic. And indeed, still, numbers are dramatically down there as well. So we saw we saw attendances for cancer, attendance for heart disease, all of the things go down uh, and deliberate self-harm went down as well. The evidence suggests that deliberate harm has actually remained reasonably stable at the moment, but the problem is, of course, what's coming around the corner. And you don't have to be Mystic Meg to be able to predict that something that increases depression, increases domestic violence, reduces job opportunities, increases substance misuse and decreases social support will, particularly when the economic uh, measures by, uh, collapse by its next year, uh, will almost certainly lead, sadly, to an increase in suicide rates. We haven't seen that yet, but it would be a very brave person who does not expect that to happen. And, and sometimes, of course, uh, the, some, of the, some of the ways in which this manifests, the mental health effects uh, manifest, are, are sometimes quite subtle. I was listening to Tim Spector, you know, who's our professor of uh, genetics epidemiology at King's, I don't know if you heard him a couple of weeks ago on a, on a King's webinar, but um, his uh, app, and probably quite a few of you are using that app, it's uh, quite helpful, um, has shown that uh, he looked at weight gain in the pandemic, which is something we haven't done. And as you might imagine, 30% of the population have gained weight, but 20% of the population have lost weight. And of course, that's not random. So the greater the levels of social adversity, the more likely you are to gain weight, uh, the greater your affluence, uh, the nearer you are to parks, a larger your garden, et cetera, et cetera, the more likely you are to lose weight. The only other thing, however, that affluence did affect was you are also more likely to drink alcohol. And as I suspect, this is a reasonably affluent audience, even though I don't know who you are, but I'm guessing that's the case. Um, you're probably in that category. I certainly know that I am. And of course, that also the effect that has is those factors increasing weight makes you more vulnerable to COVID and more likely to suffer uh, the serious harmful effects. So one last thing before Bora finishes is to um, uh, talk a little bit about th those of you in the on the medical side of things. And I can see now a few names of who I recognize. So quite a few of you are. What, um, what has happened to the health of the NHS workforce during this time? Um, well, the first thing is that it's certainly, the mental health has certainly deteriorated. Now the question is, has it deteriorated the same as everyone else, which is what's happened, or is it even greater in the healthcare system than it is in the rest of the population? And the evidence is a bit contrary on this one. Several studies, including our own population surveys that we've done, uh, going back to pre-COVID uh, era, uh, suggest that there's actually no difference in the mental health between uh, those who are key workers or work in the health service and those who are not, which um, it might surprise you a bit, but remember, as I said, it's all got worse, but there's there nothing to suggest that it's got worser, worser, what a word is it, anyway, um, in those at work in the NHS. But on the other hand, if you're doing as we do, a national survey uh, that's ongoing, starting uh, at the King's Hospitals in, in April, now um, spreading to other trusts as well, um, which by its very nature is a questionnaire survey because there's no other way of doing anything else at the moment, we find much higher rates. Uh, they're really uh, remarkably high rates um, that are quite disturbing uh, among those who work in the healthcare system. And at the moment, we're doing quite a lot of things to try and work out why this is. And there are various reasons. Um, I should say immediately it is not just uh, exposure to, to trauma. It's likely to be other things as well. Partly questionnaires give you high rates, uh, partly a response bias that you get in all occupational surveys, 
those of you who've done public health and uh, occupational surveys, I see Pete Littlejohn is, is out there, will know that whenever you put um, a, a survey to the police saying stress survey police or whatever it is, ambulance workers or teachers or nurses or politicians or whatever, you always get much higher rates. So there's a kind of response bias out there as well. Um, so all of these were investigating and starting to interview people to find out what the true rates are. And as ever, there's also another side of the story as well that you don't always uh, get from newspaper or surveys, which is we also know that some people, much as with our soldiers when they deploy, they have a stressful experience, they don't sleep much, um, they're exhausted, tired, all of those things happen to soldiers on deployment and have also happened to our NHS staff during the first part of this crisis. But on the other hand, many of some of them say that actually it was a very um, fulfilling time. And they'll tell you that never, not for years and years and years, so they haven't had such a sense of cohesion, of working together as a team, of support. The juniors say they got more teaching and supervision in one day than they'd have in the last year. That's actually a quote from somebody. But there's lots of, of, of uh, other things to, to show that even in the face of adversity, it is possible to have what we call post-traumatic growth. And many of them said it was a most rewarding experience and they would not have missed it, even though it was tiring, exhausting, etc. So we shouldn't lo lose uh, sight of that as well. And then the final point I want to make is I've been talking about mental health and obviously that's a complicated thing. So part of this is what we would call a, a natural re re reaction to adversity. Uh, that's, you know, no, no shit Sherlock would be the thing if you said depression's got worse, etc. But also we're talking mental disorder, which is a different category. Uh, but also where there's been worse thing. But, but there's also been something we're starting to see on the kind of social side of what we do for a living, which is this gradual erosion of the feelings of solidarity and group cohesion that were present at the beginning. And uh, together with Bobby Duffy from the King's Policy Institute, we've been doing a series of polls on this, showing how the, the um, that has been eroding. The country is now fragmenting into different groups. Those who are extremely frightened wish that um, the measures that we have now should be even more severe and more prolonged and are, are actually very frightened of the idea of them being lifted. That's actually at the moment the majority, but it's, a, it's still the majority. But those uh, who don't feel that way has been increasing each, each week that goes by. We see the levels of coercion being used in the population are steadily increasing, which I have to say, given what I said at the beginning about previous pandemics, bodes ill for the future as that consensus breaks. And the levels of, of argument, disagreement, uh, um, uh, abuse, etc., that has been reported has also been steadily increasing. We've got a paper coming out on that next week. All of these are not mental disorders, but they are signs of fragmentation that I have to say make me depressed a bit as I think about where we are going. And, and I think that, um, you know, these trends will continue because again, if you look at back over the pandemics, it is the social consequences of pandemics that leave the last lo and longest traces. So as that uh, ad showed when our, our last ballerina, was it a ballerina or was it an actress? I can't remember. When, when our last ballerina logs onto her new course at GCHQ and she learns cyber security, all of course totally remote as our university campuses have been given over to pondweed or possibly allotments or possibly um, what are the places to put uh, Im immigrants in. But Pretty Patel has her way and she tries to tell her children what her theatre was, reminding grandma to unmute on their weekly calls. As we slip into this dystopian future that awaits us, we should realise this has no ceased to be the simple health problem that it was in the spring. And in the end, it is those social issues and social consequences, which will be more, perhaps as much, probably more actually related to the consequence of our efforts to deal with the pandemic than the pandemic itself. So that's the hopeful view I give you the future. I hope that perhaps we will wake up to this and realize that this is not inevitable and that this awful phrase, new normal, it may be new, but it's anything but normal is not something that we uh, should uh, resign ourselves to at this moment in time. I shall stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Simon. I know, cheerful, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we now uh, 
move on um, to uh, Professor, Lee, Professor Melanie Abbas, who is a uh, professor of global mental health at, uh, at King's. As the professorial title indicates, uh, Melanie brings an international perspective to mental health. She has researched, published, and mentored widely in the field of depression in low and middle income countries and in vulnerable migrants in high income and middle income countries. She began her research career by developing methods to measure depression, anxiety and trauma related disorders cross culturally. And then went on to develop and trial interventions in low income countries, particularly in uh, Africa. She, throughout her career, Melanie has been concerned to build research capacity. 11 years ago, she co-founded the world's first masters in global mental health, which is run jointly by King's and the Royal School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In 2015, she was recognized in the list of the Institute of International Development's 100 Women Leaders in Global Health. So uh, to have a more global perspective on um, the impact of COVID-19, uh, I give you to Melanie. Thank you so much, Barry. And it's always, it's always great to follow Simon because <laughs> it gives me so much to think about. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. So um, as Barry said, my research focus is on developing and testing interventions for common forms of depression and anxiety um, in countries actually with a high HIV burden, so particularly in the Southern African region. Um, and I think what I want to do tonight is, is draw on, definitely actually expand on some of the things Simon said and perhaps try to put a little bit of theory in terms of psychiatry and psychology as to how we could use some of the great, I think some of the great knowledge we do have as mental health professionals to try to improve and make services a bit more efficient and a bit more targeting these key populations that, that Simon's drawn out, youth, people who are socially isolated, who are really gonna suffer the huge effects of COVID. So um, I'm going to try and share my slides. Um, And here they come. Let's see if that's going to work. Ah, click share. How's that, Barry? That's fine. That's great. So we've already talked about the Centre for Global Mental Health. I think uh, the other thing that I have been doing through the pandemic, as you, uh, as a clinical academic, we were all very much encouraged to not only maintain, but actually increase our clinical work for a while. And I've been working in liaison psychiatry at uh, Lewisham Hospital, part of the South London and Maud's NHS Trust. And like Simon said, actually that has been a privilege because I've been in accident emergency, I've been on the general wards and actually seen the ongoing um, you know, huge amount of, of mental health issues that are coming through the, the front door of a district general hospital. So this evening, what I wanted to uh, really make was one point and pose two questions. And I think the first point I want to make is that yes, COVID and mental health are inextricably linked, but I think they have a bi-directional relationship with, uh, with each other. And I think there are really are lessons to learn from the HIV um, epidemic, which of course is very much still um, a, a huge public health uh, challenge across uh, so, much of uh, so much of Africa and, and many other regions of the world. Um, and what we know, as Simon talked about the, what you could say the indirect, consequences of COVID on mental health. So the rise in um, you know, the, 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 the loneliness, the anxiety about contracting it, um, the economic losses, the impacts on education. 
Um, and these and bereavement, and of course, you could see these as indirect effects. There are also direct effects. Um, we know that this is a virus that causes a huge amount of inflammation, and that is probably to account for a lot of the neurological and cognitive changes that are being described. And actually, Tim Spector has been talking about this um, through his uh, through his app, discovering the brain fog and and so on, which unfortunately seemed to persist for a long time. Also, I think what's less um, what's less talked about is the fact that that um, mental disorders actually also increase risk of COVID, of, of acquiring the infection and increase the risk of mortality. And there's just been this very impressive study uh, published in World Psychiatry on this fact. And it's very much something that we've known about in HIV for a long time and actually fuels quite a lot of what um, uh, my own research is on because mental health impacts on the outcomes then of, an, of a viral epidemic. So people who, we, and we think this is mediated because people who have mental, mental health problems are, are, do unfortunately engage in more risky behaviors. They're less able to adhere to public health advice, to adhere to regimens. And they also have the other comorbidities that Simon talked about, you know, the, the socioeconomic, inequalities, um, other, you know, social isolation. And these really combine together to aggravate worse outcomes. And I think we're going to see more of this over the next, over the next few years. So what can we do about this? Um, and I think this is the kind of typical picture we think of. If we have a, a mental health problem, we have depression, anxiety, we think of going to see somebody, having somebody ask us something, receiving some counseling and hopefully recovering. But actually I, I completely agree with, with Simon's view that um, actually mental health really begins at home. It begins at home, it begins in the community, it begins with our friends. This rather messy Oh, well, not, not, not messy actually, but this, this pyramid, which um, is, looks apparently a little uh, complex to start with, but it's not really. So I just want you to look at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and I think this, is the, this draws out the fact that for most people with a mental disorder, so this is what's called a stepped care model, something very much advocated by the WHO, nice guidelines have adopted this approach for the common types of, of conditions that, as Simon said, have massively increased in COVID. It's a stepped care model. And the essence of a stepped care model is that the services should be provided in relation to the need of the, of the person experiencing the mental health problem. So for most people, Fortunately, we're going to be at the bottom of that pyramid. We're going to have a low level of need. We're going to have perhaps transient, mild forms of anxiety and depression. And really, we need to turn, as we see down the left-hand side, you see this is informal services, um, as opposed to when we go up towards the top of the, the period, sorry, the pyramid, the more costly formal services, whereas at the bottom end, um, we're going to have a high frequency of need but you can see on the left-hand side, these are the low cost services that we need to turn to. And I think when we're thinking about equity, we really need to make sure in this period of time where we're gonna see a lot of increase in need, a lot of increase in demand, we need to be really rational about service provision so that we have a way of triaging so that people who do have a low level of need are catered for through enabling them to be more resilient, to use their informal services. And then as they get to that medium and higher level of need, I do think as psychiatrists and psychologists, we do have a role to play actually in all the levels of the pyramid, but certainly not sitting at the top. If we can, I think, use some of the theory that we know to help demystify some of these mental uh, common mental health problems. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples of that. And I think the other point I think that 
you know, we see a lot of ivory tower, smart research coming out on mood disorders, um, you know, ketamine and all these fancy treatments. But actually, I think the psychiatrists, we need to become better implementation scientists. And we need to learn how to enable the knowledge that we have to filter down through to, to primary care. I think that the psychiatrists in the community mental health team, certainly the ones I've seen in Lewisham, are doing a great job trying to support GPs. I've certainly seen this in the services, almost just dictating, okay, start that lady on that antidepressant at this dose, increase it on this day, you know, in the then off on week two, increase it. This is the kind of level, this is the support that GPs need um, when, it's, when it's coming to, the, to that middle tier. And I think we can do more though as researchers to become a better implementation scientists to help understand how to improve delivery of care so that more can be dealt with in these tiers one, two, and three. So what about the self-care? Um, I think that's another area where we could do so much more. It does make me very cross when I hear Evan Davis actually on the Today programme. He completely misunderstands depression. He really does. And I tweet him. He very rarely replies. Um, he doesn't, he, he's very, you know, he's very angry because there's a rise in antidepressant prescribing. That may be a very genuine response because if there is a lot of depression and the GPs feel that they have to respond, we do know from meta-analyses that antidepressants are better than placebo for people with major forms of, of clinical depression. So maybe it's quite reasonable that we're seeing that increase. But I think we can also use our knowledge to help people cope better at that lower levels. And I just want to give two examples. Um, I, um, I totally agree with Simon that, you know, returning to our community, to our social support is really vital. I think in addition to that though, we, we can become better at self-monitoring our mental health. If you, if you wake up with a headache, or you've slept badly and you've got a sore shoulder. Most of us have an idea what to do. We're aware of that symptom. We go to the first aid box or we might go for a walk or we, we do something, we rub it, we put some ice on it. How many of us really have that first aid box in our cabinet for our mental health? We might be aware, oh my goodness, you know, I'm feeling quite stressed. If we're, if we're aware, we might notice it. Do we actually act on it? Um, and I think that the concept of which we can draw on from cognitive behavior therapy of helpful and unhelpful ways of thinking and helpful and unhelpful behaviors is actually quite a useful model. I just wanted to give one anecdote of a friend who um, was telling me that her young daughter was becoming very anxious about noise. And in fact, she asked me if I could be really careful not to slam the door um, tightly when we were coming back in from a walk. And then she proudly said that the way that she was, was supporting her daughters, that she'd gone into school and insisted that her daughter did not have to attend choir or be in the Christmas pantomime. This was before this year, obviously, where there won't be any Christmas pantomimes. Um, but, um, and she thought that was the great thing to do. Now she thought she was being a great parent, but I think if we think about what perpetuates anxiety, one of the key things is avoidance. And we have to learn that periods of anxiety will come and we do have to learn to live through them and they will eventually dissipate. But by facing our fears, obviously, as long as you're doing that in a, in a safe place, um, in a safe way that's not unduly risky. I think we do have to, to bear that pain in order to get through anxiety. And I think there are other examples, you know, where we've got a low mood and we think the thing to do is perhaps sit on the sofa and drink a bit more, eat pizza for a few weeks. Actually, we can help people reflect back when they're in the very low a mood on things that used to give them a sense 
of achievement used to give them pleasure and help them reorient, reorientate to things like that. So those are some ways I think we can, we can actually help inform and strengthen that lower level. I think another thing that I've learned, um, I was fortunate to get a chance to talk to very senior, a couple of very senior people in the IACT, Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Service, when I was preparing for this. And one of them said something to me, which I think is actually really profound, which is obviously that we had COVID and then we had Black Lives Matter. And the, the, one of the, the outreach activities from Lewis and Mental Health Services was to go out into communities, um, BAME uh, groups, and try to help people who um, were, ex were very stressed around experiences of racism, but they weren't accessing, they weren't coming into mental health services, but um, the service had heard that there was a lot of stress going on. And she made the point that really, for a lot of people, it's really important to contextualize mental health. I think we think of it as professionals, as disorders that we classify, classify almost standalone from the causation. But for many people in the community, I think it's much more rational for them. Their model is to see their stress, their symptoms, their poor sleep, their headaches in relation to a context. And then I think it's less stigmatizing and more realistic that people will be willing to engage in how they try to improve their mental health. Certainly I've seen this in HIV where perhaps there's a collective sense of, of a shared responsibility. And therefore, when we piggyback mental health onto HIV, in low income countries, it makes lots of sense. People are just very, very willing to take that on board. So, um, and where do I think that we could do a bit more at higher up that pyramid level? Um, I've worked actually for the last seven, eight years before I moved to Lewisham um, to a more general service. I worked in the IACT, Improving Access Psychological Therapy Service. And this is you know, an amazing service. It's a, a world leading pioneering program to bring evidence-based therapies um, to people through primary health care. It's, it's got fantastic things to say about it. I think that though it's very much not, what it not is, is it is not a one-stop shop for people to go and have have a joined up mental health program. So if you go and you don't respond to that low intensity first level of treatment, perhaps behavioral activation or computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, you're more severe, you've got higher needs. I know from my experience that 90 times out of 100, you will be told that what you need is a more intense form of talking therapy. And you will go on a waiting list, probably for at least six months, depending on the country, it could be longer where you live in the country. And I think that there's a big gap there in saying, actually, though, it might be worth you trying a medication and supporting the GP and working in a much more joined up way. And I think that's probably because IACT has very much come from a clinical psychology background and there just aren't leaders within IACT who also really value the, 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 the potential of joining up and adding medication in. Uh, and I'm not pushing drugs and I'm not pushing one thing or the other, but we know from the research evidence that there are a certain group of people who have moderate, so again, in going back to that pyramid, in that middle level or edging up to the higher level, who do better with a combination of medication and talking therapies. And I really think, I really hope that our next president of the college will, of the College of Psychiatrists will really, really push that idea. Minutes, Am I finishing? Shortly. Okay. Four minutes. Um, so very, very briefly, uh, my experience in Zimbabwe has been through something very, very different. This was a program that had to arise in this community, which was decimated by one of Robert Mugabe's um, operations. 
I'm a community that recognized in the mid 2000s that they wanted a mental health program, um, which had to be provided at no cost. So um, a colleague of mine, Dixon Chibanda, got together with the community and they found some tools and they found some resources um, to provide a very simple therapy. And the people who stood up and volunteered to do this are what are called health promoters. They're, they're nearly all ladies, they're nearly all grandmothers. They go about on foot and talk about nostalgia, which Simon referred to. These go back to hark back to the days where we had health visitors and district nurses who went about perhaps on foot. Fascinatingly, they, they, they do use now screening scales and they've been trained to use a very simple therapy, which we pioneered here, well, the US did in the, and then we did in the 80s called problem solving therapy, very simple structured talking therapy. That's what they use. And this is called the friendship bench. Um, and they, this has now grown. Uh, we've since completed cluster randomized trial published in JAMA. And it's been so influential using this grandmother lay worker model of simple therapies um, in the grounds, as you can see, of, of clinics, not inside. So people um, get their therapy outside. That the New York City of New York has decided to follow this. Um, and they now have their friendship benches in slightly different. And this couple who you may recognize also chose to have a session on a friendship bench. So I think what these women bring is that sense of knowledge of their communities, warmth, um, and it's very far away from digital CBT, which I'm really worried that we are heading for in this country. So um, I think I'll end there and thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you, Melanie. If we um, then uh, move on to uh, to questions, the, the the first question I'd like to ask you, which is an amalgam of um, the um, question of my own and uh, of uh, of Stephen Chalicum, and, and and that Simon statement that um, the uh, the mental health challenges. Uh, are an inverse relationship really to uh, to physical uh, challenges uh, because certainly um, the an argument at least uh, that's uh, repeated quite frequently in the in the press that the, uh, the people resident in care homes and people cut off in uh, in their own uh, homes uh, who are elderly are uh, in an extremely challenging situation, uh, whereas the uh, the young uh, haven't uh, haven't got the, uh, the the same experiences and it, and bruises of life, as the question puts it, that their networks, though more easily made, are more easily lost. And um, could you comment, Simon, not on on this issue? Of the uh, the relationship of the mental health challenge and uh, and age and also obviously Melanie uh, the you uh, oh your... Melanie's the the old age psychiatrist so I'll do the young bit first then she can do the old bit I did like that friendship bench though though Mel I hope um, I hope we will see the next one we'll have William sitting next to Harry on it that would be good now um, there's no question at all from all around the world that all the surveys show that it, the greatest rise in mental health problems during COVID has been in young people. Okay, now that's partly because there are more young people, uh, but nevertheless, that, that is what we've shown. And, I, and, and not just we, that's what everyone has shown. And I think it's because, um, I mean, I think there are lots of reasons, but the main reason for young people is because actually it's their futures that, that are being destroyed. It's not mine. Um, I'm only angry that I'm fed up, I, I don't like the fact that a younger generation are making sacrifices to protect me and I don't want to be protected. I absolutely don't want to be. Um, but they are doing that, whether they like it or not. They're finding that their, their social lives are, are being wrecked. They're finding their job opportunities. It's already clear that unemployment is going to dramatically affect that generation, not even the middle age, let alone the old age. 
Um, they're finding that half of them now say that they expect their life chances to be significantly changed for the worse by this. They are the ones who, I mean, the only good thing that's come out of this, I have to say, is this time last year, I was doing endless media about um, mental health and young people. And the rise, as I say, predated COVID, by the way. Um, and it was being blamed always, always, but always on social media. And that was you know, destroying the whole of family life as we know it and our young people's brains, et cetera. Now, of course, we don't really hear so much of that. Now we hear how great social media is for keeping people together in hard times and providing us all with funny videos. So that's one thing, thank God, that we don't have to put up with anymore. But no, overall, it's quite clear that most of the change has been in the younger generation. And now Mel will now tell me that obviously that's not true for everyone. Of course it isn't. But, um, but nevertheless, in population terms, that's the fact. Uh, Melanie will now contradict me, I'm sure. No, I won't contradict you at all. Oh, good. I think that, I think that, you know, that we have to look at the developmental stage. You know, the, the, the youth, for youth, the, their peer relationships are absolutely critical. And they also have been coached, you know, education system is very much about achievement and getting on and competition. And they have been held back by, for, by the, from their education. And this dive into online um, teaching, I have found, I mean, not, <laughs> not even online, recorded, you know, sessions where, um, so I think that they have faced huge, lot, huge losses through COVID. Um, so I'm not surprised. And I think um, so economically, you know, they, they already had all the fears, as we know, if we go back a year to, you know, getting a deposit, affording rent, getting a deposit for, their, for a mm. house. I think we, mo a lot of older people are in a much more comfortable position um, that they have some savings. Um, I mean, again, I'm talking more about um, Perhaps the average older people, clearly there are still huge, uh, there are huge inequalities. I'm not trying to say that all older people are, are doing well. Obviously, they're not. There are, there are huge inequalities, particularly people who are more isolated and living in poverty. But I think the young are really bearing the brunt. And I'm afraid that, that the, the neglect of the young is, you know, is is a real mistake, I think, for economies worldwide and certainly in African countries. You know, youth are the future of many African countries. And so um, investment in the young and more attention. I don't see young voices when we hear politicians, look how old they all are. You know, we need to hear from young people um, more to understand it, but the evidence is certainly pointing as science yeah. way. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, by definition, everyone on this call has been to university. And I imagine most of you, A, had a reasonably good time for most of the time, not all the time. But also, if I asked you, is that where you made the friends that you still have today? If we were able, if this was a meet, a proper meeting, not this ersatz awful Zoom experiences. But if I could ask you now to put your hands up, if you have friends that you stuck with all your life from your university days, you would all put your, your hands up. Now, think about what's happening now. The kind of austere, you know, the university experience is bloody awful. And we try at King's really hard not to make it awful, but it is. And, and so, you know, I, and then when we hear all the people starting to blame young people for spreading COVID, I actually get really cross, actually. The reason that the rates going up in, in, in young people uh, in, during the end of the lockdown uh, was when you went to a restaurant or went to a pub, how old were the people serving you? They were not my age, I know that for sure. And how are the people who drive taxis and deliver all your, 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 your cases of wine, as we just had one delivered now? They're not my age. And that's how they get infected. It's not cavorting on beaches. So that doesn't spread, that, that you don't get uh, COVID from, from um, outside events, basically. And there's literally no evidence for that. So when our generation start blaming young people for spreading COVID, I actually get pretty cross because I think it's unfair, unhelpful, uh, and a bit selfish, to be honest. Now, I'm sure King's graduates don't do that. Two, two, two questions, uh, really, that follow on from that, uh, from parents. 
Um, the first is um, taking up the university point. What can we do to support our teenagers who've just started at university this year when they are isolated and with very limited and new support network? And also a question from uh, a parent with, uh, with younger children in school, how do they support their, uh, their children at uh, that younger age through the, uh, the next uh, year? Well, I'll start off with the, the, the university answer. I mean, universities are doing the best they can, but it's in extremely difficult circumstances. I think the best thing to do is have a look at uh, St. Andrews, Edinburgh and Manchester Metropolitan and make sure that we do the exact opposite that they have done to their students. That's probably the best thing. Um, allow them, for example, if they have to isolate, allow them at least to do so in their social bubbles. Do not write them letters saying that if you... Um, if you break any single one of the regulations, we're going to kick you out of university or indeed call the police. So that, that's the first thing. You don't do what some other universities are doing. I'm very pleased to say King's is not doing that. I would be ashamed of it if it was. Mel, do you want to do the other half? Um, I think that, um, yeah, I suppose I go back to my my thinking about helpful behaviors and, un and unhelpful ones and helpful ways of thinking. So I think that, yes, this is, this is a very difficult time. I think allowing them to talk about it, and giving them space and time to talk, um, encouraging them to, um, you know, finding safe ways for, for the children that you're talking about, the young ones um, going to school, I think they will have a lot of anxieties, but often until we ask children what they're anxious about, we don't actually know. So we shouldn't make assumptions. Um, but, you know, letting them, letting them see that actually this is a, tran you know, hopefully a, a period, a transient period of time um, that they will get through and also helping them to articulate the positives, you know, the fact of being in the first year of university, there are real downsides to it because of the way um, all these curbs are being put on. But also, at least they're beginning their education now and they're going to have a couple and two, three years. And so hopefully when they come out of it, they will have those skills. So I think helping them to see their perspective, but asking questions, I think showing curiosity is really important. And that's something I've learned actually from working with these grandmothers. They call it opening up the mind. So ask, ask questions and don't make assumptions about young people. <laughs> Good point. I, I have words with Evan Davis, by the way. He's actually literally my next door neighbor. So I, I've already waved to him and said, I've got some news for him. <laughs> I'll make sure he replies to your tweets. He literally lives next door. He's a lovely guy. Going uh, to uh, the absolute other end of the age spectrum, a, a, a question from uh, Tina Chalican. As a trustee of... <laughs> That's not very gallant. <laughs> I sorry, didn't finish the questioner. I meant to... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. The question. As a trustee of Cruise Bereavement Care, I would like to know if anyone is doing any research on the impact of COVID on bereavement and how we should be giving support to families who have to deal with loss from a distance. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I sit on the MRC and ESRC at the moment, and there's been quite a lot of uh, uh, grants come in on, on, on that issue um, about that. I mean, I think it's almost the same answer that Mel has just given, to be honest with you. It definitely is an issue. I think the worst thing though, uh, and you probably guess what I'm gonna say now, um, it's not so much bereavement, it's the circumstances of bereavement, the really horrible way that people are dying at the moment. And, um, you know, and we know one of the reasons that death rates have gone dramatically up at home is because people do not, they know what hospitals are like at the moment and they don't, you don't want to die in a hospital at the moment. You can't even get into palliative care either. So it's not bereavement, it's the, the complex emotions that the complex bereavement that people are now facing uh, where they're not able to sit and hold hands with their dying relatives, where they're not able to see them, it's hard enough to talk. I think that's the issue. And uh, uh, Jonathan Sumption, who maybe not everyone's most popular person, but, but uh, he was writing The Guardian today and just said, you have to remember there is more to life than the avoidance of death. 
and it's a, it's about the difference between a, a bad lonely death and a, and a good death that, that my mother recently had in, in palliative care in, in a hospice compared to what's happening now and that is where you get guilt and anger and shame uh, among the relatives and, and I think the only way to do it is we've, we've just got to start making some compromises we, we just have to allow people to take some risks we have to allow them to take to decide what level of risk they want to take and that's what we're not doing and sooner or later we're going to have to do that and if you want to visit and if your elderly relative wants you to visit them in in circumstances that may convey some risk i just don't think we can continue to coercively deny that thank you yeah i'd agree with that and i think they're talking about prevention i think when that's i think the the thought of these very painful and and isolated deaths, leaving a bereaved person, to me was one of the biggest fears about mm. There I could see the immediate translation into what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, because having those images, um, you know, can you imagine those images through the, how people were using FaceTime and so on to see their My elements? Pads, yeah. Absolutely horrific. This fulfills the criteria of a severely traumatic event. And um, there are you know, evidence-based ways to help people deal with that. Some of it is through telling the story. So I think support groups, being able to have an opportunity to, to tell the story, to perhaps write the story down. Um, so the problem is that we feel guilty. And when we feel guilty, the natural thing we do is we don't talk about it because we blame ourselves and think, maybe if I had gone to the hospital and knocked on the door, I would have been allowed through. Or maybe if I'd kept her at home, she could have, maybe she would have survived. So people, the brain has this natural tendency to blame itself um, when in, in the context of a trauma. So I think understanding those reactions would be the first thing, uh, healing. And Pete Littlejohn, who I just mentioned, who is in the audience, has just written a brilliant blog on this, actually. And it's really all part of, of moving towards realizing sometimes the, the cure. We will realize in two or three years time, as we have done from other pandemics like Ebola and things like that, there comes a point when the cure is worse than the disease. Uh, and uh, we have to add up the suffering that, that is being caused now um, uh, uh, into the kind of the balance sheet as we decide what we have to do. I don't know that we can, the second lockdown is going to be pretty grim. I don't, we can't, I don't think we can keep doing this forever. We've got to start having uh, these, these discussions about how, how do we want to live and how do we want to die? And um, I know where I stand on these now and Pete's blog, which maybe you'll put, send round Peter, if you're listening and you've got the link, um, which is very new, um, is very good. And, and it's not often you hear a public health person being open about uh, these issues. To have one, one final question then, to, to try and end on a, a more positive note possible. <laughs> we, Good luck. Uh, the, uh, the, the discussion last week of which uh, Peter was a, uh, was a, a panelist. Oh, right. <laughs> it in part included a, uh, a discussion on how dealing with the ethical challenges of, of COVID had led to changing structural relations in the provision of uh, services to GPs and a much closer relationship between uh, consultants and GPs being able to access uh, consultants' advice. Now, from what has been said this evening, it appears that the same may be happening in mental health. So do you think that as a consequence of the the difficult time we're living through, that the provision of mental health services may, may change as a consequence of the lessons learned? This is the digital question, is it? Um, is, is, that what, is that what Peter was asking? I mean, certainly there have been benefits, there's no question. Um, my wife, who I can hear upstairs, is, is one of the experts on this, is uh, through things like uh, um, uh, uh, electronic GP services, uh, all of which has, has speeded things up and had some advantages, including mental health, and certainly uh, in, in delivering some of the easier treatments that we do. I think there is a limit, though, and I would 
go back to where you introduced me as who spent two years thinking about the review of the Mental Health Act. And uh, we certainly think there um, we should, the, the act itself should be digitalized for all sorts of very, very good reasons. But does that mean that we can digitalize the actual operation? No, it can't. When it comes to dealing with the most severe forms of distress, um, of psychosis, of madness, of insanity, um, where the, some of the most complex situations arise involving lots of people in very, very fast moving and difficult environments. The idea that that can be digitalized and we can go on to a kind of virtual mental health act assessments, I think is pie in the sky uh, and, and we shouldn't do that. Ditto with some of the more distressed and, and, and uh, complex interactions, Mel, that you and I have with people. Uh, there is something possibly irrational, I don't know, but people, when they're really in the extremes of distress, they still want to see another person. That may not be true through radiology or histopathology, but I still think psychiatry has a great future uh, where people still want to have that comfort and that interaction with an actual person. Melanie, do you want to add anything to that? I don't think I could, I don't think I could top that, that's right. Therapy needs a therapist. You know, it, it does need a person. And I am very worried that um, in the same way that VA, you know, British Airways accelerated the move to, to its new program, you know, and not sort of use COVID as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an excuse for doing it. I'm worried that the move to digital therapies is gonna be accelerated through this. And actually, if we go back to Jerome Frank, you know, we do need empathy and warmth and human connection through therapy. Uh, and that's something we've learned, you know, I've learned through the friendship bench. So I, I, I would hope that we, we still keep meeting and connecting. Melanie's friendship bench is an amazing piece of work, I have to say. I wrote a review, with, a review for our ref return and it is an absolutely fantastic uh, five star, one of the greatest pieces of research that King's has done, actually. And I genuinely believe that. Well, and uh, I'll just say it's Dixon Chabanders, but with with King's oh, okay. <laughs> with King's involvement, we're very 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 pleased to be very strong partners in that. And True. we, yeah, but thank you for that. Well, that's a, a very very positive note on uh, on which to end. Can I uh, can I thank um, Simon and Mel for their uh, really really stimulating uh, contributions? and um, reminds people that uh, next week we uh, will be moving forward again and looking at how we rebuild our economy and society after the devastation that the uh, lockdown uh, is, uh, is, is causing. So I hope you will join us uh, next week for that session. But uh, thank you ever so much for your uh, contributions and everybody for listening and uh, asking questions. I'm sorry that I was uh, only able to deal with, uh, with a few of them. Thank you very much.